Uh, yeah, so passwords are cool. Really? Um, so first of all, this, uh, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, and this, I, I will be covering a few works, uh, I mean, sampling a few works uh, with these uh, co-authors and maybe others. Um, and the explanation of the title is uh, what I wrote, I think, in the abstract, which is password authentication is the shallowest, most boring, and inherently insecure cryptographic primitive, how much we can uh, 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 innovate or, or study or care about this uh, stupid stuff. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, th there is some work uh, uh, to be done. Um, of course, I don't have to tell you two things about passwords. One is that they are really the basis, and this is, this is real, I mean, the basis of security of everything in this world, even when you have a better means of authentication or protection, somehow, somewhat, the, there is in the, in, 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 the, in the path of trust, there is some, uh, some password. Um, by the way, I, yesterday in uh, Shafi's talk, I was thinking about this uh, right to be forgotten that you can ask <laughs> Google to, to erase all your information. Now I'm really changing my password to a strong one because having someone finding my password and telling them to erase all my Gmail, that would be a real disaster. Anyway, so, uh, so yeah, they, they, they are significant, but they are very, very poor because of the low entropy and because passwords are stolen all the time. Billions of passwords, only s uh, just three billion of them just from, from Yahoo. And uh, the, the reason the, uh, uh, people are able to, to do the things is because there are these password crackers. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but you know, uh, this is not the most updated information for one of the m mechanisms there is to, to hash passwords. They can do three billion passwords in, in, in five minutes. So, yeah, so uh, passwords are uh, very uh, fundamental uh, on one hand, but they are very, uh, very, very uh, insecure. And, and not, not only there, the issue of uh, finding uh, passwords and, and cracking them, I mean, uh, from, from hashes and stuff like that, uh, there is also this issue of uh, <laughs> Facebook stored hundreds of millions of passwords in plain text. This is an accidental thing, it's not uh, on purpose. Uh, another one, I, I, I'm giving you examples of Facebook and Google because these are companies that are supposed to have good security. So Google stored passwords in plain text for 14 years. Um, so should we get rid of these passwords? Uh, uh, in 94 or 95, Shia Levy came to IBM as a in summer intern, and I had some work that I did a couple of years before related to passwords. Uh, and at the time, I saw that it's not interesting because they are going to die. You know, these passwords, no, no one is going to use it. You know, it was the, when public keys started being uh, used, I mean, practical. Uh, well, two years later, when Shai came, you say, you know, let's let's do something about that. Well, now uh, I don't know. I don't want to say 25 years after, uh, still uh, they are here. They are too convenient, and uh, there are all, all kind of uh, ways people are trying to replace them, but they are, they're here to stay. Anyway. Uh, Yeah, well, there you go. Uh, you have the, the right to forget your password, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, uh, you know, the truth is that there are many, 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 many uh, good uh, reasons to use passwords, and I will not show you in, in this talk, uh, but uh, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to f sound too, uh, but anyway, we have a, a set of works that if they were implemented in the real world, the security of passwords would change dramatically, okay? So I will, I will mention a, a couple of these, maybe. 
Um, so, okay. So wh what are the attacks that are more common? Online guessing, you know? Uh, if I have a certain password, if someone uh, guesses my password, that's it. It's, it's gone. And that means that you can try uh, to, to get to my Gmail by trying the different passwords. Uh, you know, if, if you choose a bad enough password, it will be found. Otherwise, there are ways of, uh, you know, not letting you to do too many attempts on the same account. Uh, the, the attackers have ways of going around the things. There is second factor that helps, but basically guessing the password, that's an unavoidable attack. Another attack, the, the, that's how the three billion uh, passwords or more are, are stolen, is by the offline dictionary attacks. You go to the server that has some information about the password of the users. So for example, if they, if they uh, store the name of the user and the password in the clear, of course that's bad, you find the password and that's it. If you hash the password, it's equally bad because instead of looking, because you create a dictionary uh, for every password in your dictionary, you compute a hash of the password and then when you break into the server, you find immediately uh, the, wi wi which password corresponds to the hash. Therefore, what people actually do, or at least should do, is to salt, I mean to randomize the hash. So instead of uh, storing the user the, uh, and, and the hash, you, 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 you store user salt and the hash of the salt and the password. The salt is per user. So what happens is that when the attacker breaks into the system, it can still run a dictionary attack. Uh, on, it, it takes you, it takes salt, salt of you, it hashes that sort of you with each one of the passwords in the dictionary, and if the password of the user is in the dictionary, it finds it, okay? But what is the point? The point is that it, the, the attack can only start once the server is broken into, okay? You cannot do pre-computation, all right? So this, this is a very, very important technique. Um, and uh, as I said, even if salted, this is the most effective attack in the sense of how many, uh, I mean, that's the main way in which uh, attackers collect uh, millions or billions of, uh, of, uh, of passwords. And the, the bad news is that this is unavoidable. If, for, if, the, if the server has any way of testing a password, then the attacker can do the same. So these uh, offline dictionary attacks upon server compromise are unavoidable. Another issue is whether the password is visible to the server, okay? So uh, using the technique of uh, hashing the password with the salt, the, the way in which the server checks the password is by getting the password in the clear, now running the hash on the salt and the password. So the, the, in that technique, the server actually needs to see the password. And this is what happens in in practice, 99.9% uh, .9 of um, uh, password authentication just uses TLS. You just transmit the password under uh, TLS, and the server decrypts, has the password, and checks it. So the password is visible to the server. Why, do that? Why people do that? What do you want them to do? Um, okay, so uh, we, we will talk about ways of, uh, of, of, of avoiding this, but this is what happens uh, now. And this is not only visible to the server, it's visible to many other points, at least potentially, uh, you know, uh, there are all kind of middle points, uh, even for security, that they are able to look into into the TLS stream and uh, you know things end in some CDN, etc. So uh, the, and, and and this, by the way, a reason why um, Facebook uh, stored uh, things in the clear, not because they st stored them in the clear in order to verify them, but by mistake. Okay, because what happens is not that the server sees the, the password and erases it immediately. Actually, they send them to some other place to be more secure. We send them to another place to, for the password to be checked. And uh, this is how, I mean, of course it's a bug, but. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, uh, another thing is that really depends on the security of the certificates, of the TLA certificates. If someone can break the PKI, the public key security, in any way, then they will find the password. Then there is phishing attacks. Uh, if if uh, there's the famous uh, old uh, example of PayPal, right? There was PayPal.com in which they replaced the L with the one. Uh, so if you go there, you just put your password, and since it's in the clear to the server, they they find it. So uh, as opposed to the uh, online and offline upon the. Uh, uh, server compromise that were unavoidable, all these things should be avoidable. So can all of the above be avoided? Huh? That's a deep question. OK, so what, what we want is a password for the client server setting. And when I say cli cl client server setting, I'm differentiating it from the peer-to-peer -peer or peer-to-peer -peer setting, which is two parties that uh, both of them share the password. So if you break into one of them, uh, 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 then they, they have the, the password. The, the, the peer password is also a setting that uh, is significant in practice, but uh, much more or less than the client server, which is we use all the time. So we want uh, that no pre-computation attacks will be possible. You, the attacker should not be able to build any form of a dictionary that will help uh, uh, before it actually breaks into the, into the server. Once it breaks into the server, we know that it's unavoidable to have some form of offline attack, but it, the attack should start at the moment in which the server is broken without any advantage from before. And the plain text password should not be visible to the server, and uh, we should not, I mean, the, the, the whole security should be dependent on the password, which is what the user has, and nothing else, okay? It shouldn't, it shouldn't remember a public key of a server or even have a means, you know, a certificate or something like this. There should be the user completely naked and with a password in his mind. Um, so what, this is what we want. Uh, and by the way, I, I, I'm talking all the time about password in the sense of authentication, but what we really want is password, password authenticated key exchange. Uh, PAKE, and give me a second, and what we call asymmetric PAKE. Uh, symmetric is the case of, uh, of peers that they share a, a password. This is asymmetric because it's between the client and server. They will not give the same information. Is that one of those things that automatically comes from the two-party pre-computation that you want something that is efficient? Uh, it's a... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, well, um, so, so here, you know, in the, in the peer, peer the, the, the two-party authentication is clear, you know, they, they have the same input and you want to compute the equality function. One at the time, or the other one at the time. Right, yeah, okay, so, so the question is how you define the state. I mean, different ways of doing this thing. So it doesn't come directly from from, from the generic thing. <laughs> but, but definitely, w we are interested in things that will be practical, as, as Tal said. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm allowing anything, anything that will have these properties and be practical, okay? But, but yeah, wh one thing that I didn't mention is this thing. When I say that we don't assume any PKI, or, I mean, the, 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 attack, the, the, the client doesn't carry with him any public key, this is true for the regular login at registration. Yeah, there is a need for the user to know who he is exchanging the password with. So for registration of the password, of the account and the password, then there should be some secure channel, okay? So that, that's, that's also uh, unavoidable. 
Uh, I, you know, uh, Zvik, I am not completely sure how to, if, 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 if I get exactly there, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a solution and, uh, which includes public key but of the user. But. So essentially what we want, and this is the, the bottom line, we want that the only attacks that are possible are the unavoidable attacks, which so far we said one is online guessing, the second is offline dictionary attack, when you break the, comp the, the server, but no pre-computation. So this is what we want. What we knew, I mean, we, before uh, we started this work, is that we, we knew uh, asymmetric pegs that were secure against pre-computation attacks, but open to password visibility and uh, PKI uh, insecurities, and this is exactly what we do all the time, this uh, password over TLS, okay? so. That was one, uh, one, one, one technique we knew. And we also knew many PKI-free uh, asymmetric pegs that will not show the, the server, the password to the server, but that were open to pre-computation pre attacks. This was, the, the fact that they are open to pre-computation attacks was true for practical proposals in this area and also for very theoretical ones including probably secure uh, schemes. Now, they were probably secure with respect to a definition that actually allowed for pre-computation attacks. And in, in, to me, in all this uh, work, one of the most amazing things is, is really how come for many years uh, these definitions were accepted when the whole thing of asymmetric peg is about preventing pre-computation attacks. I mean, the papers doing that also say that, except that uh, they, you, you had to break into the server to actually run the attack, but the dictionary could have been built before. Now, it was not as bad as hashing just the password because you could hash the, so the, the password with salt, but then you transmitted the salt in the clear between the server and the client. Okay, so now we get to this opaque protocol uh, which is the first strong asymmetric peg, we had to give a, I mean, this should be, actually, it should have been just asymmetric peg, but since asymmetric peg was defined with the pre-computation, allowing pre-computation, so now it's strong asymmetric peg. Um, and the nice thing, uh, and, and, and the, the basic element that we use is this uh, amazing, beautiful uh, object called the oblivious pseudo-random function. Uh, that has a long uh, history. It was uh, formalized in uh, this paper, uh, which I don't remember the authors. Uh, I, I only remember those that are in the audience. Uh, Pintas, uh, Ishai, where is Ishai? Okay, so <laughs> uh, Omer is not here, so I don't mention Omer. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, no, he's not here. So, sorry. Yeah, Friedman is the other one. Anyway. So well, what this primitive is, is a pseudo-random function that comes with a, a two-party computation to it where the user has an input, the, the server has a key to the function, and at the end of the protocol, the user learns the, uh, the, the output of the PRF on its input, and the, uh, the server learns nothing, okay? Uh, so, this in particular, it doesn't learn about the input and doesn't learn about the output, <laughs> okay? So, this is the OPRF. The OPRF has amazing, beautiful uh, applications, and uh, we use it here. Very, very simple idea of this protocol. Uh, uh, so, what do you do? So, you have the user that, uh, okay, you have the, ser the, the server will have a key, okay, a key K. The user will run an OPRF with the server and on, on its password, okay, so, so basically it will be uh, that picture where the user enters the password, the server has a key K, and the, the user learns the output of the function on, on, on the password uh, I, I, I write PWD for the password of the user and RWD for the randomized password that comes out of the OPRF. The, the server will store a key K for each user, I mean, independent key for each user. 
So what, what happened is that the, 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 the user exchange its password for, for a random value, okay? That's, that's what the OPRF does. And no one, uh, that includes uh, the server, but any eavesdropper will learn nothing about the password or, 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 or the output of the fu function. Therefore, this RWD can actually act as a complete full cryptographic key for anyone that doesn't know the password, okay? So once, once uh, the user has actually retrieved this, uh, this cri strong cryptographic key, RWD, from the server without anyone learning anything about the, the key or the password, now we can use that retrieved uh, value as a private key of the user in a key exchange, okay? And this is what opaque is, very simple. We assume a key exchange with public uh, private keys. There is a private key for the user, public key for the user, private key for the server, and public key, uh, pu private and public key <laughs> pairs for the server. At registration time, uh, the server will choose an OPRF key K and a pair of private public keys for the server, okay? The user will run an OPRF with, the, uh, with S on the input PWD. It will learn this value RWD. It will then generate a public, uh, private public uh, pair preview pub U and will uh, build an envelope, we call it an envelope, which is an authenticated encryption under RWD of the user's private key and the server's public key, okay? And the server will store uh, the, its own uh, private public key a pair. It will store the OPRF key that it chose for this user, and will store also the envelope that he gets from, from the user. Okay, all of that happens during registration. No, the, the user doesn't learn the key. The uh, S chooses the key. Which one? The server chooses a uh, random OPRF key. If the user, if the server wants uh, to cheat, uh, to, to, to learn the password, um, yeah, so, um, this is why uh, we, uh, it's, I, I'll, I'll say something about this, but let me say it now. Uh, the, we need the notion of an OPRF that is secure even for adversarially chosen keys, okay? So this is one of many subtleties uh, around this stuff. I mean, on, on, you know, on, uh, uh, Conceptually, all of these things simple when you start getting into the details is less, but this is definitely a good point. Um, okay, so during lo login, what happens is that the user takes its password, runs an OPRF with the server, learns RWD, it receives end from the server, it decrypts it to find its private key and the public key of the server, and now they both U and S can run any key exchange that you want based on these, uh, on these keys. Okay, so, you know, the, the whole thing is the OPRF is a secret retrieval. I mean, re I, I'll give you, I, I mean, I exchange my password for a, for a strong key. Now with a strong key, I can do all kinds of things. In particular, I can run a, a key exchange protocol. So that's it, that's, uh, that's the protocol. It's basically, you can think about as a compiler from any OPRF, authenticated encryption and key exchange into this strong APEC. Idea is simple, uh, but may, there are many set subtleties uh, around this thing. Uh, in particular, the key exchange must uh, satisfy forward secrecy, security against reverse impersonation. The authenticated encryption must have some property called key committing. The OPRF needs to be collision resistant and uh, as Amir 
not surprisingly pointed out, it needs to be also secure against uh, adversarially chosen keys. Um, yeah, and at, at, the, at the end, when you take all of, kind of all, all these subtleties and uh, many others, at the end you can actually have a proof uh, of this being an asymmetric peak in, in the random oracle model uh, with a very non-trivial proof. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll leave something to say at the end about these proofs. Uh, yeah. I need I need secure channels for what? No, 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 no. So let me let me show you how we, we implement this thing. Uh, so this is the most uh, you know straight straightforward at least at this point in time uh, and uh, efficient uh, OPRF. The OPRF is basically uh, defined. You take the input. Doesn't matter what the input, where the input comes from. You hash it into a group, a cyclic group of prime order, uh, and then the key of the, uh, the PRF is a random exponent. Okay, so you take x, you hash it into the group, you raise it to the key of the OPR of the PRF, which is k, and when you get that result, you hash it again with the random oracle. This is something that, uh, at least as a PRF, originates in, in the work of the people here. Uh, <laughs> Moni, uh, Benny. Oh, again, uh, Omar should have been here. I mean, I don't know what he's doing. Anyway, so yeah, so uh, Naor, Pinkas, Rengold, uh, they were users of this before, they were users of this after, but this is what we use. And the reason this is our PRF is because there is a very simple protocol uh, to blind the input to the function. Okay, so let me go fast over it. The, 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 the client has an input x. It uh, ap uh, applies h uh, to x to get an element in the group, choose, uh, uh, elevates it to a random value r, sends that to s, we call that a, s that has k will take that a, raise it to the power of k, send it back to, you, to the client, and the client will take what it got, this b, from the server, will de-blind, yeah? It raised before to the power of r, it now uh, uh, raises to the power of one over r, and by the magic of commutativity, <laughs> the, he gets back h, x to the k, uh, which is, uh, you know, and, and applies to H prime. So basically, since the since what the client the client or user is doing is to take this H x to the power of R. Basically, this is a one-time pad. This is uh, not not only it's uh, it's uh, you know no, no one learns anything. I mean, it's information theoretically secure. Okay, and it's very 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 efficient these days. It is uh, one exponentiation for the server, two for the client, and one hash into the curve operation for the client, which, which, is, not, which is not for free, I mean, depending on, on, on the curve. So this is the OPRF, and uh, the, so OPEC, oh, by, by the way, uh, one of, uh, what, what's, what does it say there? Uh, uh, okay, I, I, I better don't, uh, what it says is that our, our OPRF, the one that we actually use to prove the thing, is, has the X, the input, is hashed also outside the H of X, okay? We, we need that for, 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 for the proof, uh, and of course it doesn't cost anything uh, per performance-wise. I, I was looking for, say that again. Well, the K is unique per, per, uh, per user. Per user, yeah. Uh, it's not the same. It's not. When, when, the when you register the, 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 the server chooses the K for you and then uh, um, so, okay, so the, 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 the whole protocol is what you 
see there is in green, you see the, the OPRF uh, part of it. In, uh, in black, you just add a Diffie-Hellman exchange to it uh, with some MAC values to do the authentication. And uh, basically, that's, that's, that's the whole protocol, okay? And okay, so the, the, the MACs are computed with keys that are derived uh, from, from the Diffie-Hellman values, the session keys also uh, <coughs> derived from these values. I mean, it depends on the key exchange because this is a generic thing. But so th this is one implementation. In particular, if you implement uh, the K exchange part with HMQV, that I'm sure you all know about it. <laughs> no. Uh, so this is a very, very uh, efficient protocol. So if you do that, then the complexity is the complexity of the OPRF plus the, the Diffie-Hellman, basically, an, a, a, a different operation. Uh, and what uh, is very significant right now, I mean, right now there is a kind of a competition going on or they're choosing to standardize an APEC in the IETF. And uh, so OPEC is one of, of the candidates there. One of the things that is significant for this protocol is that it is very easy to actually compose it with TLS 1.3, which is the new, the, the new version of, uh, of, of the TLS. Uh, which, by the way, is one of the advantages of being generic, is that you can choose actually what, what key exchange to, to, to build this. Uh, how long do I have? Uh -huh. 13 minutes, OK. Um, Okay, so to summarize, we have this opaque protocol, which is modular and flexible, a really important uh, practical uh, property, again, because you can, for example, people are interested to, to run this with TLS, to run this with Ike, to run it in other, un, other key exchange protocols. Uh, so the fact that you can plug in different key exchanges is, is a good thing. It has efficient instantiation. Oh, here is the standardization work going on. And I, I like to say this, that uh, before we needed TLS to protect our passwords. Now we can use our passwords to protect TLS. And the meaning of that is that if you do this APEC, not only you are doing strong password authentication and you're not revealing the password, but you are also, if, if, if the TLS breaks because of PKI, which happens, then at least now you have now you have to break uh, the, P the PKI and, and, and the password. So it's a kind of a hedging, or what I call password protected TLS. Do you think both implications can be uh, 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 Suppose I know your password. Uh, if, if you have the sufficient security of the public key. So suppose you do have a public key. Yeah, yeah that, that's the hedging, really. That, that's hedging. So you, you, can, uh, you, you can run this. I mean, you, 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 you still have the public key from the server, so you're still going to do the, the TLS thing, but on, on top of it or under it, you're running this page. So at the end, if you, to break the, the, the session, you need to break both the, the public key of the server, and the, that's why I call it the, the hedging for, for PKI failures. Okay, uh, so the, the, the proof of security of the particular instantiation that I showed is uh, uh, in the random oracle model under gap one more Diffie-Hellman. Uh, I, I wrote red on the red round, uh, random oracle model because this scheme is very, very based on random oracle model. It uses random oracle model in all bad ways you can use the random oracle model. It, is pro it is programmable, it is uh, ideal, it is, I don't know, it is, uh, it, it's very, very heavy. Actually, the UC definition of APEC can only be 
the, the, the one we use on, uh, and, uh, okay, actually, I think that any, any, uh, okay, uh, I shouldn't spend time saying this, but I will say this. <laughs> I ended the dialogue with myself. No, um, no it's, it's interesting because this asymmetric peg says once you break into the server, now you need to work proportional to the size of the dictionary. Now that's a lower bound, right? You're saying you need to at least work such and such time. We don't have lower bounds. I mean, how, how are you going to achieve a, a, a something like that? So the only way we have to achieve something like that is that we can count something, right? So if it is random oracle or maybe the generic uh, group model, but it's something had to an oracle that you can uh, count how many times you're calling it. So in that sense, the notion is, uh, th th there are some attempts, but uh, it's cheating. I mean, there, there are people that uh, I have some uh, definitions, but with the hash function, it actually, you know, it's a random oracle. So, uh, so, you know, it would be interesting if, if something better can be done at, at that level. Um, I didn't mention that, but uh, here you can make uh, this more secure by having the client w have to work more time. Um, uh, okay. There, there, uh, you can extend this to, to credential retrieval, but le let me that, skip that and go to, to this, the, this is the problem that I, I will not show you the solution, but I want to tell you about the problem because I think the problem is very interesting. The problem is you, you want to, sh to store some very valuable uh, uh, secret. For example, 1,000 algos. Okay, 1,000. <laughs> 1,000 bitcoins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the fact that I bought the things, <laughs> that's a very good one. <laughs> yeah, the secret, is, uh, the secret is that you bought them. <laughs> I won't tell anyone. Uh, so you have 1,000 uh, bitcoins, uh, and you know, it's a string of 256 bits, and you, you want to protect it. So what, what, what people do, you, you know, you put it on the server, okay, and you hope that the server will not cheat you, or, you know, uh, or it will not disappear. So, you know, if you use a single server, then you have a single point of compromise. Okay, uh, sorry. The idea here is that you want to have a secret somehow and protect it under a password, okay? You want, the only thing you want to remember is the password and you want to protect <coughs> it that way. If you put it in a single server, then it's a single point of uh, failure for availability. If the server is gone, the secret is gone, but it's a single point of failure from the point of uh, secrecy because if someone breaks into the server, that runs a dictionary attack, uh, and, 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 and now it, it can retrieve your, your, your secret. So clearly we need a multi-server solution because the single server will always have these uh, single point of failures. And we know how to solve the, uh, Adi solved this issue a long time ago. It's called secret sharing, right? You take your secret, you, you share it in, in five uh, servers so that you have to uh, go into three of them to retrieve this, uh, and that's it. So we, 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 we solve the problem, right? The issue is, uh, the issue is, okay, you have three servers or five servers that will give you their shares if you ask for it. How do they authenticate you? With the password, of course, right? Now you have five servers. Which password do you use? The same password? You didn't do anything. Actually, it works. Now there are five servers that can be broken to find your password, okay? Okay, so random passwords, independent passwords. Probably password one, password two, password, you know, that, that will be the thing. So really the, pr the problem is how can you do something like this uh, that, uh, yeah, it's password protected secret sharing. You want that as long as you break into T or less uh, servers, you don't learn anything. You don't learn anything about the secret. You don't learn anything about the password, nothing. You need to break into T plus one in order to be able to access the the, the secret, you want basically to leave the only uh, uh, option for the attacker is to guess the password and run an online attack. Okay, and we give uh, such a solution. It's based again on OPRFs, uh, on uh, a threshold of PRFs, 
I, I will not show you, but basically if, if you, you know, if it's a threshold of PRF with some, uh, some uh, details around it, but, but that's basically it is. You, you, you uh, define the secret as the, out, the OPRF on the password, you know, now, now you have a random key, you can do with it whatever you want. Um, but I think it's a very, it, it's, 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 inter it's, it's an interesting problem because we don't think about it. You say, okay, I, I share my, my, my secret over the password, over the server, but how, how do you authenticate to this uh, server? So I think that that's interesting. Um, yes? No, no, so, uh, w uh, I mean, it depends on, uh, b basically we think about the, the server, the secret that you store is a random key. Now you, don't, you do with it whatever you want. You, you want another, you, if, I mean, you have your uh, wallet, your, uh, uh, your bitcoins, you encrypt them under the secret that you retrieve. <laughs> no, and you can, that one you can put where, wherever you want. Um, so, I, uh, okay, uh, I, let's, uh, five minutes? No. Four, four minutes, okay. Ah. Argentinian streets, ten. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, th these are four different things that uh, we have uh, done uh, around this work, o uh, all with OPRFs. So uh, one is uh, the, this password protocol that leaves online attacks as the online only option. That's, a, a, that's the opaque. Now the magic password manager that solves the entropy problem. So I show you th this, this asymmetric opaque does as, as, as well as it can be done for, for these protocols, but it doesn't solve the entropy problem, you know? If people will be still using low entropy, then the, for example, the, the, the dictionary attack, uh, once you break the server, is still possible. So, th are, so what do you do? You ask people to choose high entropy passwords, that's impossible, so they have a password manager. So we offer a password manager that you can do it online or on a device, but what password managers do now, they take uh, the passwords they encrypt them under your master password and they put it in some device or in the server now or on your computer. If you find that uh, list of encrypted passwords, you can run a dictionary attack on the master password and once you find it, then everything is gone. So in this magic password manager, the, the only thing that the, the device stores is an OPRF key. And all the, uh, the uh, passwords are derived from this OPRF key. So anyone breaking into the server or the device find something that is basically independent of the passwords and the, and the master passwords. And then there we have a two-factor authentication, which, uh, because at the end of the day, once you do uh, opaque and you do the, uh, the password manager, then the only thing that is still open is the, is the client. You know? they, can, they can steal the password from the client. So here is two-factor authentication, helps us with that, and we have some work on that too. Okay, so now really to the uh, final remarks. We love to focus on futuristic applications, but there is a lot to contribute to the boring now. Uh, and you know, these the things, it's, you know, it's, it's not easy for the world to actually implement these things. Probably uh, there is a high probability that uh, OPEC will be chosen as the uh, standard, but chose, being chosen as a standard doesn't mean anything. Question is, do people use it? F Facebook, because of this uh, bad publicity of their hundred millions of passwords stored in the clear, are, are now very interested in this, so maybe that will help, we'll see. Amazing role of theory, I mean, I don't have to tell you the things, but I am amazed each time anew of how well uh, theory of cryptography works in, 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 in practical stuff. In particular, I, use, I, I like to say proof-driven design, you design the things thinking or, or, or developing the proof and that actually tells you where, where, where to go. Simplicity is beauty and practice forces you to be simple. That's one of the things I like about practice. Uh, and last complaint is that we, we, we have a problem with definitions and proofs. Uh, 
uh, this opaque protocol, which is a trivial thing, takes 30 pages of, 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 of uh, proof, uh, which we actually, it's an interactive proof. You know what the interactive proof is? The proof and the, defini the UC definition, okay? <laughs> You're supposed to have a definition and prove it, no? But here it's, a, it's an interactive, because now finally you say, suddenly you say, okay, but oh no, but there is this element that actually must be here, you know? This, this, there is this message that must be sent, so we'll have to, anyway. Uh, I think we have a problem with that. You, you can look at the, m most crypto papers are, uh, you know, if, if you see a paper of 20 pages, I reject it, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you.